We're going to do a song. <laughs> this is uh, I Am Spirit. And it's actually a more reflective, meditative piece than the other one that I'm not doing. But it's um, it's got about a one minute musical interlude for meditation. It's all fine. I 
part of our oneness. Um, she is uh, just a light in the world. I've known Sandy for about, I think, three years. And she oh, she tells wonderful stories. She's a wonderful teacher. And she just really is a being of light. So please welcome Sandy. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, everyone, for joining with me in that. And, you know, I've, I've said before, I think the course appears to be really complicated, but I think actually it's very simple, and I want to extract something from that song that we just danced to. The more I see with the body's eyes, the less I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I know one thing, that I love you. Uh, Love you too. Love you too. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> to me, that is the course. <laughs> yes. Um, just to you know, stop thinking and seeing with the body's eyes, and just focus on love, and that's what I think it's all about. And 
I think that's what um, Jesus wanted us to know when he wrote the course. And so um, I've been missing Lisa and Bill a lot, and so today I'm going to channel Lisa a little bit because I brought her book, Gorgeous for God. And I'm reading that, and I'm really loving that book. Um, it's like Lisa reminds me of her because it's brilliant but so relatable and down to earth. And so it's it's great. And um, so there's a part right in the beginning that says, the teachers of God are not perfect. This is from the teacher's manual. The teachers of God are not perfect, perfect, or they would not be here. Yet it is their function to become perfect. And so they teach perfection over and over in many, many ways until they have learned it. And then they are seen no more, although their thoughts remain a source of strength and truth forever. And I love that because I'm teaching and I'm not perfect. <laughs> and raise your hand if you're doing the course perfectly in your life day to day. <laughs> Show of hands. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that's important to remember that, um, you know, I'm not doing the course perfectly and I'm guessing that nobody's doing the course perfectly, but we're learning and we're trying to learn it together, which is beautiful. And um, so I'm going to fess up something because I always try to fess up. And, um, and, you know, sometimes like when I'm, Kelly knows this about me, when I'm ashamed of something, like if I've done something, if I've made some mistake, I always talk about it because I don't want to hide anything in shame anymore because I used to do that. I used to always try to hide who I was and, and um, it was about hiding and I don't want that anymore. So I always try to fess up. So I'm up here and teaching and dancing, but you know, I have always considered myself to be a wicked shy person, like really quiet. Um, self-conscious and growing up I never said anything I'd be like the one person in school who never raised my hand and even you know as an adult in work meetings I'd be in a room like this and, and never say a word and I was judging myself so harshly that I didn't want to talk I was constantly on my back and you know, and I still, that's probably my temperament, that I'm shy and, you know, I've always had a tendency to look at people who are like outgoing and gregarious and people person, you know, and, and be like, I'm less than that. You know, that's like, that's not me, I'm less than. And um, even like, you know, I felt, I have a tendency to feel socially awkward, like at work and at parties, even here sometimes I'll feel socially awkward, like just shy, you know, and, and um, I'm fessing that up because <laughs> I don't want to define myself in those ways anymore, you know. I think, I don't think Jesus, Jesus is out there, or spirit, or God being like, yeah, that's the quiet one. <laughs> oh, there's a lot, there's a lot of gregarious one. Oh, yeah, there's the brother that's um, the bright one. Oh, there's the cheerful one. Oh, there's the sad face. You know, I don't think Jesus is doing that. And I heard um, somewhere, like, spirit knows our strengths and weaknesses, and spirit will use those, you know. If you're musical, like Darko, like the word will be through your music or whatever your strength is. Spirit knows, but I don't think Jesus is up there looking at me like she's the quiet one. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I'm trying less and less to just to define and judge who I am and who other people are. I don't want that anymore. I, I want to get up here and, and dance and you know look like a fool and do the chicken dance, whatever it is. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so I love that. You know, teachers of God aren't perfect, and we're not doing the course perfectly, but we're trying and and doing it together. And um, there's another part of Lisa's book that I really loved, and it's in the beginning. And she gives this story about her cat and a bird. And she talks about her cat, Sam. And so Sam br brings a bird into the house. 
and she's you know freaking out and so is the bird um it's alive and um you know sam's probably really um proud of bringing this bird in and she's like oh my god and um the birds so the bird's alive it's freaking out so what does she do she opens the door wide open you know so the bird can fly out but um, the bird doesn't fly out. It kind of flails, it's thrashing, it's throwing itself around the walls and it's hurting itself. And um, she said, we're like that. You know, there's a door that's wide open, but we don't fly out. We, you know, for years sometimes thrash, yeah, and like hurt ourselves. And I read that, and I'm like, oh, that's so perfect. I can so relate to that, that, you know, there was always a door open for me. But for years, I didn't take it. Maybe it wasn't comfortable. It was more comfortable to, to thrash and flail against the wall. And, you know, for me, it looked like um, self-hate. Like that was like, let me throw myself against the, safe hate, the self-hate wall again, or, um, comparing and contrasting with other people, um, feeling less than, you know, judging, um, believing in loss and separation. You guys know who heard me speak before that, um, you know, my dad committed suicide when I was five and for like 40 years I just thrashed against that wall. Like, um, he left me, um, I didn't deserve love. And, um, and I just, yeah, like sadness, loss and separation. It was like hurting myself over and over. And um, finally, you know, well, with the course, I finally saw that door was open. And I think, you know, it was always open for me. The, the voice for God was always there, but I wasn't able to hear it for a long time. But spirit brought me here. Spirit wanted me to be here. So it helped me to see that that door was open. And um, Lisa also said in her book, Be Still, it's the only way. The miracle is happening all the time, but you're so preoccupied with things like survival and safety that you don't see the miracles that are all around you each and every moment. You don't see the beauty and splendor. You don't see there is another way. You don't see the open door. You don't see the solution. You are too busy worrying about the house going into foreclosure or gas prices going up or trying to figure out how to make your partner love you forever and not leave you. Worrying about what other people think about you. What if you just simply stopped all your planning and organizing? So. I'm going to tell a story about my birthday, and some people have heard me share some of this before. But um, so my birthday was in April, and um, I always struggled with my birthday because <coughs> my dad actually suicided a week before my fifth <coughs> birthday. And um, you know, I wanted a pink pony, but um, but my dad suicided, and so. The message that I took from that and carried around with me was like, it didn't matter. You know, your birthday didn't matter. Um, it wasn't important. And, um, and I lived that. You know, every year when it was my birthday, I didn't really want to acknowledge it. Um, I tried to like sweep it under the rug, um, not tell people. And, um, and I did that, you know, for many, many years. And, this year, um, I think I listened to guidance because something told me about a month before my birthday, call your, my birthday also falls during April vacation and I'm a teacher and I have kids in school and so something said, call your cousin John in Arizona to see if he's around. So I did and he said, yeah, I'm around. And I said, well, how about this week? And he said, sure. And he said, I'll plan everything because I have stuff going on or whatever. I'll take care of the plans. I said, okay. I never mentioned it was my birthday. 
So um, I ended up at the Grand Canyon on my birthday, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> through no fault of my own, but I did listen to guidance, <laughs> and um, you know, it was in an interesting trip because the day before we went to Sedona, and like I'm so, I'm very controlling, like fear and security, living for that, that's me, I'm always trying to make myself safe and secure, and um, so we went to Sedona, and my cousin John's like the opposite of me. And he's like, well, I'm going to take you a different way to, to get to Sedona. We're not going to go the usual way. We'll kind of go the back way. And it ended up being like this two-hour off-roading drive where like only, usually only these pink Jeeps go, like trained professionals drive these things. And we were like in his Jeep, and we were like on these little narrow roads, up, like going up the sides of cliffs, and like you're, you're bumping your head and like hanging over the side of the car, and there's you, you have to navigate like which side's more perilous, the right or the left. Mm. And, um, you know, and it's like, it was funny for me because certainly threw me out of my comfort zone because um, I'm always, you know, I'm like safety Sandy and he's like um, risk taking John. But I think spirit wanted me to do that. Like, let go of control for just a minute because look at the beauty at the top. You know, and when we got to the top, it was so beautiful, but I wouldn't have gone, gotten there that way if I didn't go, you know, take some risks. And it was good for me because I tend to um, get stuck, you know, in that fear and the need for safety. But it's a lot of fun to not live in that all the time. And, you know, even with the can, and I also thought with that road, it's like it's kind of like the level of form. A lot of bumps and ups and downs and twists and turns with the level of form. But if you vert, if you do a shift in vertical perception and you get to the top, you do see the beauty and you see the love. And um, at the canyon too, when I got there. It was so beautiful. It was surreal. Like I, it looked fake. It actually looked like a <coughs> backdrop to me. It looked so beautiful and so fake. And what occurred to me up there was like, you know, this is all fake. And probably the most <laughs> and the, probably the most real thing here is the space, mm -hmm. like the space of the canyon. And, you know, what do I want to fill up my space with today? Do I want to fill it up with safety and security and control? Or do I want to fill it up with love and beauty and, and risk-taking and trying and stepping out of my comfort zone and just loving everybody? without judgment, loving myself without judgment. This is what I want to fill up the space with because we can create um, and that's what I want to create today and move away from that other, other stuff of just constantly needing safety. Um, she says, um, so it is with God. He's attempting to speak to you all day long, but are you listening? Are you focusing? Are you paying attention? Are you being quiet and putting your other tasks aside so you can hear? And the only problem you could ever have is guilt, which, is a, which arises from separation. In the moment of remembering yourself, you know that you have no problems. You know the separation did not occur. You remember that you are here only for the healing of the world. You remember that you, what you see means doesn't mean anything. Are you going to stay in hell, or are you going to remember that within you is the power to change your mind? And I see that for a long time I was believing my interpretations of everything. And more and more, I'm listening to what spirit's interpretation is, what God wants for me, what God always wanted for me. And now I'm willing and able to hear. And you release the past. You release your thoughts. You release your beliefs. 
You release your pain. You release your limitations. You release your ideas. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. And I also wanted to read Lesson 151. All things are echoes of the voice for God. And I also heard Michael, um, Michael Murdett, um, James Twyman talking about this. And he said, you know, it's not the voice of God. Like, you're not going to hear a booming voice of God. It's the voice for God, which can speak through me, you, um, nature, whatever it is. The voice for God is out there if we listen. No one can, can judge on partial evidence. That is not judgment. It is merely an opinion based on ignorance and doubt. Its seeming certainty is but a cloak for the uncertainty it would conceal. The needs irrational, it needs irrational defense because it, it, it is irrational. And its defense seems strong, convincing, and without a doubt because of all the doubting underneath. You do not seem to doubt the world you see. You do not really question what is shown you through the body's eyes. Nor do you ask why you believe it, even though you learned a long while since your senses do deceive. That you believe them to the last detail, which they report is even stranger, when you pause to, to recollect how frequently they have been faulty witnesses indeed. Why would you trust them so implicitly? Why but because of underlying doubt? Which you would hide, which you would hide with show of certainty. I have a little story about that. Um, so for years, I've been struggling with allergies, like this time of year and stuff, like nose dripping, eyes dripping, ear hurting, like sinus infections, on um, so many different medications, oral medications, nasal medications. And um, constantly complaining about, oh, the mold, oh, this pollen, all oh, the grass, the trees, oh my gosh, everything's blooming, oh my gosh. I uh, can't go outside, and I think there's dust in this house. And so finally, after years of this, I went to an allergist, and I got those scratch tests, which I almost passed out with because I don't like needles. So I'm sitting there like, oh my gosh, and look at all these needles. She's had a case of needles. <laughs> the results? I'm allergic to nothing. <laughs> nothing. I'm allergic to nothing. <laughs> so that just like, I believe what my senses tell me. OK, yes, I have tons of allergies. And so, the, so the allergist is like, here are some more medications that will help with your it's non-allergic rhinitis. <laughs> and I went home and I'm like, throw all those allergy meds out. I don't have allergies. <laughs> I'm not going to believe what the body's eyes tell me anymore. Or what my nose or eyes do either. <laughs> How can you judge? Your judgment rests upon the witness, witness that your senses offer you. Yet witness never, never falser was than this. But how else do you judge the world you see? You place pathetic faith in what your eyes and ears report. You think your fingers touch reality and close, close upon the truth. This is awareness that you understand and think more real than what is witnessed by the eternal voice for God himself. Can this be judgment? You have often been urged to refrain from judging, not because it is a right to be withheld from you. You cannot judge. You merely can believe the ego's judgments, all of which are false. It guides your senses carefully to prove how weak you are, how helpless and afraid, how apprehensive of just punishment, how black with sin, how wretched in your guilt. Whew, I can relate to that. This thing it speaks of and would yet defend, it tells you is yourself. And you believe that this is so with stubborn certainty. Yet underneath remains the hidden doubt that what it shows you as reality with such conviction it does not believe. It is itself alone. It is, it is itself alone that it condemns. It is within itself it sees the guilt. It is its own despair it sees in you. Hear not its voice. The witnesses it sends to prove to you its evil is your own, is your own are false. 
and speak with certainty of what they do not know. Your faith in them is blind because you would not share the doubts their, lo their Lord cannot completely vanquish. You believe, you believe to doubt his vassals is to doubt yourself. Yet you must learn to doubt their evidence will clear the way to recognize yourself and let the voice for God alone be judge of what is worthy of your own belief. He will not tell you that your brother should be judged by what your eyes behold in him, know what his body's mouth says to your ears, know what your fingers touch reports of him. He passes by such idle witnesses, which merely bear false witness to God's Son. He recognizes only what God loves, and in the holy light of what he sees, do all the ego's dreams of what you are vanish before the splendor he beholds. Let him be the judge of what you are, for he has certainty in which there is no doubt, because it rests on certainty so great that doubt is meaningless before its face. Christ cannot doubt himself. The voice for God can only honor him, rejoicing in his perfect, everlasting sinlessness. Whom he has judged can only laugh at guilt, unwilling now to play with toys of sin, unheeding of the body's witnesses before the rapture of Christ's holy face. And thus he judges you. Accept his word for what you are, for he bears witness to your beautiful creation and the mind whose thought created your reality. What can the body mean to him who knows the glory of the Father and the Son? What whispers of the ego can he hear? What could convince him that your sins are real? Let him be the judge as well as, as of everything that seems to happen to you in this world. His lessons will enable you to bridge the gap between illusions and the truth. He will remove all faith that you have placed in pain, disaster, suffering, and loss. He gives you vision which can look beyond these grim appearances and behold the gentle face of Christ in all of them. You will no longer doubt that only good can come to you who are beloved of God, for he will judge all happenings and teach the single lesson that they all contain. He will select the elements in them which represent the truth, and disregard those aspects which reflect but idle dreams. And he will reinterpret all you see in all occurrences, each circumstance and every happening that seems to touch on you in any way from his one frame of reference, wholly unified and sure. And he will see the love beyond the hate, the constancy and change, the pure and sin, and only heaven's blessing on the world. Such is your resurrection, for your life is not a part of anything you see. It stands beyond the holy and the world, past every witness for unholiness, within the holy, holy as itself. In everyone and everything, his voice would speak to you of nothing but yourself and your creator, who is one with him. So will you see the face of Christ in everything, and hear in everything no sound except the echo of God's voice. We practice wordlessly today, except at the beginning of the time we spend with God. We introduce these times with but a single slow repeating of the thought which the day begins with. And then we match our thoughts, appealing silently to him who sees the elements of truth in them. Let him evaluate each thought that comes to mind. Remove the elements of dreams and give them back again as clean ideas that do not contradict the will of God. Give him your thoughts, and he will give them back as miracles, which joyously proclaim the wholeness and the happiness God wills for his Son, as proof of his eternal love. And as each thought is thus transformed, it takes on healing power from the mind which saw the truth in it, and failed to be deceived by what was falsely added. All the threads of fantasy are gone, all that remains is unified into a perfect thought that offers its per perfection everywhere. Spend 15 minutes thus when you awake and gladly give another 15 more before you go to sleep. Your ministry begins as all your thoughts are purified. So are you taught to teach the Son of God the holy lesson of his sanctity. No one can fail to listen when you hear the voice for God, give honor to God's Son. 
and everyone will share the thoughts with you which he has translated in your mind. Such is your Easter tide, and so you lay the gift of snow white lilies on the world, replacing witnesses to sin and death. Through your transfiguration is the world redeemed and joyfully released from guilt. Now do we lift our resurrected minds in gladness and gratitude to him who has restored our sanity to us. And we will hourly remember him who is salvation and deliverance. And we will give thanks. The world unites with us and happily accepts our holy thoughts, which heaven has corrected and made pure. Now has our ministry begun at last to carry round the world the joyous news that truth has no illusions and the peace of God through us belongs to everyone. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here and thank you for joining with me and I love you all. That girl, the light of the world, or what? Yes. Right? Thank you, Sandy. Your teachings are always so great. Um, so I want to just dovetail on to Sandy's lesson for the day in terms of um, seeing the face of Christ in everyone. Um, kind of easier said than done sometimes. <laughs> everyone? Um, so I sometimes talk, I know Sandy is in my Monday Night Course in Miracles group and she's heard um, me speak a number of times um, about this particular subject. So, um, so I have a, a boyfriend and he's a wonderful man. Um, and I, I think he is, um, when I'm perceiving him correctly, he is the face of Christ. And he is my brother, whom I love. And when I am perceiving him incorrectly, uh, I have all kinds of judgment and um, projection and misperception and all of that. So I recently had an experience where I had, um, uh, you know, a, a mis a misunderstanding, a miscommunication, whatever we want to call it. But man, my ego uh, mind, that part of my mind that is illusory but feels very real sometimes, just wants to grab onto it and and nurse it and uh, feed it. And <laughs> so I spent a um, a, a, a long ride from Vermont to um, Massachusetts to New Hampshire you know at, at least two hours uh, silent and upset and um, thinking of all the judgmental thoughts that I had and making um, making making them real I guess I could say and so I ended up writing him a letter. And the letter, uh, the letter started out uh, sort of talking about um, his childhood and my childhood and what I knew of our childhoods and the parenting and the, why you got to be this way and I got to be that way and, and all of that. And, and then it just, you know, I had prayed before I wrote the letter I had put put it on the altar. I had, you know, done sort of forgiven it, um, not numerous times, and um, and so I really did feel like spirit took the pen when I was writing this letter. And after all of the sort of um, sort of unreal stuff from this world came out of me, then what? I ended up, what ended up being said through me, I, I don't take any credit for saying this, was that everything that I had actually just said, like this entire letter actually doesn't really matter because what it is all representative of um, in talking about childhoods and parenting and all of that, I talked about abandonment, feelings of abandonment and, and all of that and fear 
that it was all representative of my feeling of separation from God and that it was all representative of my unconscious guilt because I felt like I had separated from God and that really what I was asking him for was to help me to be to remember that and to help me remember my who I am and who he is which are who are one and that whenever I have any kind of a difficulty and I am projecting it as being him or something he is doing or I'm projecting it as being uh, something from childhood or whatever else that it's never anything else one problem one solution one problem is the belief in separation one solution is forgiving everything that comes up before my face that looks like separation and that does not look like love and therefore reducing the space between us and bringing us back to oneness. And so I talk a lot when I have the opportunity to talk in here and certainly we talk a lot in my Course in Miracles group and uh, about forgiveness and about the purpose of forgiveness being reducing that space between us and bringing us back to oneness. And I talk a lot about sometimes, as the Course says, like sometimes you will see changes have, appear to happen in the world around you as you're undoing your unconscious guilt through forgiveness. And sometimes it's just changing your mind about it. And so even if nothing in the outside world changes, you just it doesn't have the same hold on you. It doesn't have the, the same impact on you. And so I just will say that for this particular circumstance that I talked about, um, as I was reading the letter to my boyfriend, um, he was sitting next to me. We were sitting in my bed and I was reading it to him and he was sitting next to me and I think he was sort of braced for like the angry letter, <laughs> except it wasn't. There was nothing, it was, not, it was not angry at all. But he was just sitting next to me listening and then as I got to the part which was, you know, two-thirds of the way through the letter and continued through the, through the end of the letter where I just talked about it being really not about him at all, not about me, not about childhoods and parents and, and, and all of that. It really was about me and my own belief in separation and that it was really essentially my issue because there really isn't anybody else out there. Um, he went from sitting next to me to just sort of curling around me and holding my words. And he is not, of course, a miracle student as as I would think of a Course in Miracles student, reading the Course and so forth. But the first thing that he said to me when we had this altercation in, in Vermont, before any of it happened, before, but I mean, my judgment had kicked in and my reaction had kicked in, but the very first thing that he said to me about it when I, when I said that I was upset was, can't you just put it on the altar and forgive it and let it go? <laughs> so he's not a Course in Miracles student. I'm, you know, I'm not so sure about that. So, um, so the upshot of all of this is that because my mind has changed about that circumstance and because I not only did the forgiveness work around it, but I actually just took the responsibility uh, for, for my experience and put it where it really needed to be, which is on my own belief in separation. My outside world has continued to seemingly change and, and reflect, you know, reflect something very different than it was reflecting on that day. And so it's just, I just, it's just amazing how this, how this works. So I just wanted to share that with you. Lynn, who we just sang happy birthday to, and who's launching her birthday week today. Yeah. 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 Lynn has uh, something that she would like to share with us. So she's going to come up and do that. Oh, good. And yeah. that's going to be awesome. And then I'm going to come back and 
lead us in the um, true prayer meditation that I've been doing sometimes lately, and then we will um, then we will do our closing prayer. So I give you Lynn. Thank you. This is awesome. This is awesome. Thank you. And a little backstory. First of all, I really wanted to read it today because David is here. And um, on my journey, I feel like David really was the first true teacher of God that I could recognize. Of course, they've been slamming themselves into my life. <laughs> I didn't say my good recognition. But David was just in the right time, the right place, with the right words. And I'm eternally grateful to God that he sent it to me. Thank you, David. And so the other part is, um, I mean, I've meditated and prayed for many years, but I'm learning to really open into a space where I feel like I have a more direct line with God. One of the things I do is a knitting ministry, and I do meditative knitting. And I was doing a loving-kindness meditation while I was knitting, which is, I want you to be well. I want you to be happy. I want you to be peaceful, and I want you to be loved. And suddenly there was this other thing, like a download. And I thought, oh. So I stopped knitting and I wrote it down. And I got back into the zone and it was like another download. There were four downloads. Actually, the first one came last. And I feel, you said, you know, you didn't feel like it really came from you. You were spirit. I honestly don't feel like this came from me, but I would like to share it with you. So the name of it is, I walk through the world as a creative expression of God's love. I heard you through the ears of God today. I heard you say your holy name, I am. I heard you say I am poor. I did not understand, but I gave you what you asked for. And then I heard you say I am <coughs> afraid. I did not understand, but I gave you what you asked for. I heard you say I am unworthy. I did not understand for how could my beloved, my perfect child, my creative expression of all that is good be unworthy of anything? I decided to remind you of a gift that I have given you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift gives you a way to speak to me directly. Go now into the silence. Call upon Holy Spirit and ask for me, because I heard you in the ears of God today. I met the messenger of God today, singing a song of perfect joy, clothed in wondrous feathers of hope, taking flight to show the way, the way to rise above our earthly worries, to fly to freedom, a perfect communion with Spirit. I recognized a messenger of God today, I walked in the footprints of God today, feeling the power of walking in freedom, freedom from judgment, anger, hate, or sadness, walking in love, joy, peace, and gladness, walking in silence and feeling the holy instant. I walked in the footprints of God today. I saw you through the eyes of God today. I dropped to my knees as I beheld your beauty. My heart filled with fire at the expression of God's magnificence that you are. My arms spread wide to receive the light of God's love that you are. I saw you through the eyes of God today. Thank you. Oh. I think we might have just seen another face of Christ right there. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Wow. So many gifts in this in this community and seeing so many of them today. So very grateful for that. So um, I'm going to lead you in a meditation of um, true prayer. Um, defined by the Course in Miracles as um, true prayer being letting go and surrendering uh, the things of the world that we think we need 
as our gifts to God, laying them on the altar, and, and the true prayer is the communion of God, and that is what is described in the Song of Prayer, the supplement to the Course. So I uh, just invite you to get comfortable. What I'm going to do, for those of you who haven't been through this meditation already, is I'm going to talk for the first part of it um, as, a, as a sort of a guided visualization, and then go into the silence, and then we'll be in the silence for um, as time permits, and then bring you back. And again, I invite you to get comfortable and close your eyes if you'd like to. And just take a deep centering breath. And I invite you to imagine yourself as standing, holding the hand of Jesus in a beautiful place. So maybe you're in a temple, or maybe you're in nature, or maybe you're in some other place that you consider to be beautiful. And as you're standing there, a beautiful white light begins to come toward you and envelops you. And this light is pristine and amazing. It is soothing and warm and as it permeates every inch of the space around you and through you, as you breathe it in, you experience a feeling of complete joy. And this is the light of God. And you see before you an altar of light. And this is God's altar. And on this altar you place everything that you think you need in this world in order for you to be happy. Whether it's a situation, a relationship, a condition, a health concern, you just lay them all on there as your gifts to God. And in doing so, you are telling him that you have no God before him, and no love but his. And when you are complete in laying all your gifts to God on the altar, you watch the altar as it recedes into the light. And then you, holding the hand of Jesus, step into the light yourself. And as you appear on the other side of that veil, everyone that you ever loved is here. No matter whether they have appeared to make their transition from the world or not, everyone is here that you have ever loved. Every human, every animal, and there's no one to miss because nothing can be missing in oneness. Nothing can be lacking in fullness and wholeness. And it's the most amazing feeling. It's, it's absolute bliss. There's no problem. There's no nothing to worry about. Everything is love and you're so filled with joy. And this is heaven. And you are in the peace of God. And from this place, you speak to your creator. You say, Father, Mother, God, thank you for creating me to be exactly like you. Thank you for loving me into being Thank you for providing me with everything that I need. Thank you for being with me in every step, wherever I believe that I am. Thank you for speaking to me 
through all of my brothers. Thank you for helping me to see the great face of Christ in all. Thank you. And now I just commune with you and get lost in your love. I love you. Thank you. Just as the wave can never be separated from the ocean, nor the rays from the sun, we can never be separate from God or one another, for we are one. There is no separation. So I invite you to bring your awareness back to the present moment in the room where we believe we are, knowing that you can always return in your mind to this place where we really are and commune with spirit. Thank everybody again for being here today and all who spoke and all who listened and you know teaching and learning are the same 